So the goal of this module is to demonstrate a good approach to a typical scene and then I'll intentionally create some problems with this scene and demonstrate some of the ways to fix them so that you can apply the same approach when you run into the same problems with your scenes. So let's go ahead and start and if you want to follow along open the file called hampton01.max. This is a project that 3DAS worked on for the hotel chain Hampton Inn and just so you can see what I'm going to try to reproduce here are the final rendered images. Now rendering a scene of this size will take too long to show in real time so uh, most of the time when I render I'm going to immediately skip to the final image rather than making you wait each time. It just wouldn't be practical to do it any other way. Also in this project I used a program called Onyx for all the trees and plants and unfortunately I can't distribute these models so the scene that I've made available contains no landscaping. Landscaping will obviously change the look and feel of a rendering but when you're working on a scene in a production environment I would either hide all the vegetation anyway to minimize render times or I would just wait to populate the scene after the lighting has been set up. So I wouldn't be rendering with these objects in the scene anyway at least for test renders uh, therefore I'm not including the vegetation in this tutorial and that should be just perfectly fine. Likewise I can't distribute the cars shown in one of these views because they were purchased through Sure 3D uh, but those two would not be shown during the lighting setup anyway. I want to give a little background information about this scene before I begin. It's a fairly small scene which contains about 930,000 faces not including the uh, almost 10 million faces contained within all the V-Ray proxies that you see around the scene. Uh, the V-Ray proxies in the scene were basically the 3D cars that you see, the 3D trees in the foreground, and in the background I have a standard 3D background rig uh, that I use for almost every scene. It contains two cylindrical objects which are visible with the camera but not visible in reflections and it also contains a hemispherical object which is visible to reflections but not actually visible through the camera. Notice also that I'm using 2D trees in the distance to break up the horizon line. You never want to see the horizon unless it's on the water so to break up the background I scattered various 2D trees around the perimeter of the scene as well as some individual faces which at a distance looks like uh, underbrush and this is a really good way to create backgrounds for your visualizations. Uh, it's simple, it's streamlined, it doesn't take very long to render and if you want to read more about this you can check out the Visualization Insider article entitled A Little Background Information and that's on CG Architect. One more important note I need to make about the background rig is that all the objects that make up the background are illuminated independently of the rest of the scene. The three sky objects are illuminated by a single omni light positioned directly in the center of the background objects and the 2D trees are illuminated by four direct lights positioned around the boundary of the scene. And this was done so that the brightness of the background objects could be controlled easier and separately from the rest of the scene. And I'll be talking more about these background objects a little later but what's important to note right now is that any light that I add to this scene will automatically want to illuminate these objects. So what I need to do each time I add a light to the scene is to exclude these objects from the effect of the added light. And I'll demonstrate this when lights are added. Finally, if I click the background dome or cylinder objects and select V-Ray properties, notice that I've disabled the generate and receive GI options. This is important because these objects are very large relative to the other scene objects and if these options were enabled they would cast a tremendous amount of GI on my scene, so much so that they could completely change the appearance of whatever skylight that I use. Okay, well, before I add my first light to the scene, I want to highlight something really important about any scene that you work on. The brightness of a scene is obviously dependent on the intensity of the light sources, but it's equally dependent on materials in a scene. As you probably know, in the real world, dark colors absorb light and bright colors reflect light. Well, in V-Ray it works the same. I often see users trying to add lights to their scenes before applying materials, but the problem with this is the illumination they're working on is so dependent on the materials because the materials bounce or absorb light. So I would always recommend applying materials before placing the first light. 
Obviously the materials don't have to be perfect, but they should at least be close. To demonstrate just how much the materials in the scene affect the illumination, here's the same scene from the top view, and this shows the sight elements before materials were applied. Now to show you the effect that these colors have on your rendering, here's a rendering showing just the building and the basic sight elements. A single direct light is being used to simulate the sun, and materials have been applied to the building, but not to the sight elements such as the grass and the roads. The site elements started as line work imported uh, from AutoCAD and converted into 3D models. Um, they contain the same colors that the AutoCAD line work contained because materials simply haven't been applied yet. When rendered, it's clear to see that a great deal of light is bouncing all around the scene. Notice that in direct light, shown striking the north side of the building here, the building's objects don't appear to be receiving as much bounce light as they do when objects are in shadow. This is actually not the case. They're actually receiving more bounce light because the light strike in the ground objects in front of this end of the building has a lot more energy and more light gets bounced onto the north side. It only appears to be receiving less GI because the bounce light is so overpowered by the direct light. On the east side of the building where no direct light is being received, the illumination of the building is at the mercy of the surrounding objects. Trying to light the scene at this point would be a wasteful endeavor because once you apply the real materials to the site, it will look completely different. You know, it's going to completely change the amount of light and color strike in the building. The point is, you should get the materials as close as possible before trying to get the lighting right. Getting back to the scene with materials already applied, I'm ready to start working on the lighting. And the first light that needs to be placed in any scene is the strongest light, which for an exterior daytime scene is obviously the sun. There's only two different types of lights that I would recommend using to simulate the sun, and that's the V-ray sun and the standard light. Like real sunlight that strikes the earth, both of these lights cast parallel rays. And I recommend avoiding the use of other light types such as Omni lights or the V-ray plane, which are simply harder to control and usually less efficient with the energy that they throw out. Unlike the V-ray sun and direct light, other light types don't cast perfectly parallel rays, and placing them too close to objects can cause hot spots to appear. One other possible option would be uh, using the photometric sunlight daylight system, but I personally haven't found the same kind of speed and ease of use with these features that I found with the V-Ray Sun and the standard direct light. You can certainly use the photometric feature for a shadow study, but beyond that, I would stick to the V-Ray Sun and the standard direct light. So the first thing I want to determine is from which direction to have the sun strike the building. In this project, this end of the building faces north, and with the sun in the southern hemisphere, sun will be striking both long ends of the building evenly. Most clients I've found care less about the correctness of the light orientation and the shadows, and more about whether or not the visualizations look good with any particular light setup. Only a small percentage have ever cared to ensure that the light is placed in a real-world fashion. This project was given to us solely for the purpose of winning city approval, which for this project was difficult because the proximity of the building to a major highway shown here just 60 feet away. It wasn't because of the difficulty in determining where the shadows were going to lay. So the money shots in this project were these two shots from the east, and these were the important shots that needed to have direct sunlight on them. The third shot was a less important shot used more for marketing purposes down the road. So after making the decision to show the project from these two perspectives, I know that I want to place my sunlight right about here. I'm choosing this particular area because I always want to show one side of a building in full sunlight and another side in shade whenever possible. With the sunlight position here, I'll get some good illumination on the, on the east side of the building and I'll get some good shade here on the north side. Uh, which just so happens to be where the shade would actually fall in real life. So just as a side note, if this side of the building were the south side, which naturally would receive sunlight all day long, I would still, in most cases, choose to keep the sunlight positioned so that this end stays in shadow. I do this because having one side in shadow... Like